Morning, church. Good morning, bro. Good morning. Happy New Year. Good to see you all here. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I've seen you already. <laughs> That's okay. I'm glad that you were all able to come out, that you didn't uh, party too hard or stay out too late, that we were all able to come together to worship our Lord and uh, to be bonded under the common foundation of Jesus Christ and His saving work. That's what we're going to be talking about today, is the salvation is the foundation. I did not plan for that to work. But if you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we'll be reading verses 10 through 17. And we'll be going over about how we build up the temple of God and how important it is to take care in how we build each other up and how we ourselves are built up to be the temple that God dwells in. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 10. According to the... Oh, sorry. Let me go back up first. Start, let me start in verse 9 and set the stage for you a little bit. Last week, Josh led us through... Um, how the church in Corinth was not spiritually ready for solid food. How they were going back to the basics. They had formed schisms and factions. There was envy and strife and all sorts of basically chaos in the church at Corinth. And he said, I wanted to come to you with more advanced teachings, with further information, with uh, how to behave as Christians. But I have to go back to the beginning because you've rejected the word of Christ. And then he uses the analogy of a field, talking about how he and Paul are nothing compared to God. How they've, they've started to say, I am of Paul, and I follow him and his teachings. Well, Apollos is better than Paul, because he's more advanced, and he's with us now. Paul left us. Or, I'm of Christ, you know, I'm better than all of you losers who listen to other teachers. I just listen to Jesus only, and that makes me better than you. It's good to focus on Jesus. It's not good to use Jesus as a reason to be above other people. And he says, like people working in a vineyard, people working in a field, I water, you know, I plant, Paulus waters, neither one of us are really anything. It's God who's doing all the heavy lifting. God's providing the growth. Stop trying to have these factions and schisms between each other. It's all focused on God. So now here in verse 9, he's actually going to shift analogies. And it's interesting, I don't see this too often in parables and teachings, where in the middle of analogies, he just switches context, and he changes the focus of where he wants you to think about. So let's read, starting in verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another person is building on top of it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, expensive stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet only as one through fire. Do you not know that you are a temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy. And that is what you are. Let me go back to the beginning on this section. I said he switches analogies. He says, you are God's field. You know, me and, Apo me and Apollos and anyone else who teaches, we're just doing the work that our master God told us to do. We're not really doing all that much. God's the focus here. You are God's building. Suddenly he changes analogies completely to focus more on the little individual work that the teachers do. He's already made it very clear that God is the one to be revered. Don't hold people up on pedestals. God's doing the growth. God's doing the work. He's going to change it because he also wants to mention how important it is that the little bit of work God has assigned for you to do, you need to do it well. There are consequences to how well you do 
the planting and the watering. And he changes it to a building because it makes a little more sense. So let's talk about this. Now that we're talking about a building, I had uh, Jordan read 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 through 12. We're often referred to as the temple of God, with Jesus as the chief cornerstone. When we are building each other up, and you'll see that phrase a lot throughout the scriptures, build each other up in love, you know, work hard to build each other up in spirit and in truth. When we build each other up, we can either do it very well, we can consider hard how best to serve each other, to grow each other, and in addition, we can be growing ourselves through study of the word. Uh, First Peter mentions how the word is what brings growth. When we grow, we can either be very careful on how we are taking the word of God, understanding it, and putting it into action, or we can be very careless. We can believe anything and everything that comes our way as long as it has the stamp of Jesus somewhere in there, which unfortunately is most of what I see on Facebook. And it can lead to a spiritual building that is shoddily built. Let's continue on here. Let's listen to the analogy that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building on top of it. But each man must be careful how he builds. For no man can lay a foundation other than that which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Kind of almost contradictory sounding, bear with me. Paul says that he came in and he laid a foundation. What was that foundation? Jesus Christ. That's all it was. He brought the message initially to these Corinthians. He said, I have great news. Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Savior of the world. He died for your sins. If you are baptized into his name and believe in him and follow him, repenting of your sins, you will be saved as well. Basic Christianity 101. Then, after that, he left and others, teachers like Apollos, are building on top of the foundation that is Jesus Christ. He's saying that he delivered the, the one true foundation of which there is no other. If it doesn't have Jesus in it, it's not a good foundation. It's not going to last. But then he says that someone else is building on it. And each man must be careful how he builds on the one foundation of Jesus. Back in 1 Peter chapter 2, before verse 5. If I can Back in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. And coming to him as living stones, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for the holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Same exact message of being built on Jesus Christ. But as we grow in our knowledge, as we grow in our works, as we grow in understanding how to serve Jesus, how to be the people that he wants us to be, to be that temple that is worthy of, of offering spiritual sacrifices to God, we have to remember that it is only the word that gives us the truth. It is only what was already preached, what was already teached, that gives us any sort of truth or any sort of way to decipher what is true and what is false. Going back to Paul, he uses the example of gold, silver, and expensive stone as one building material. And the other example is hay, wood, and strong. Then he says, these will be tested by fire. Pretty sure if I knew that my house was going to be tested by fire, I wouldn't build it out of wood, hay, or straw. But you have to ask yourself, what does it mean to be built out of wood or hay or straw? And when I was just looking at this section of verses, I kind of struggled at first, I'll admit. I was doing what I say over and over not to do, get the context. He's talking to a group of Christians who have just been chastised for splitting into factions and focusing on things that aren't really important, but in the name of Jesus. He hasn't said they've fallen away. He hasn't said that they are without salvation and they're going to hell. 
and they've got to just start from scratch. He says, you know, you're my brothers. In the very beginning of Corinthians, he addresses them as the brethren, as the saints. But then he's telling them, look, you have the foundation. You're on Jesus. But everything after that, you've lost your way. You're not loving each other like we've commanded you to. You're having factions. You're saying, I'm above you or you're below me. You're celebrating sin because you think, well, since we have Jesus, this is fine, right? You know, pretty much everything that could go wrong was going wrong in the Corinthian church. And so Paul here is saying, when you are growing in your knowledge, when you are growing in wisdom, when you are growing in word and deed, in actions of how to be a Christian, quote unquote, you need to keep it all grounded in what the foundation was built for. Imagine a skyscraper, if you will. They lay down this huge concrete parking garage. It can survive, uh, you know, a 10 on the Richter scale earthquake. It is built for a 100 foot tall skyscraper, 100 story, 100 foot sounds weird, 100 story skyscraper that, you know, no matter how the wind blows, no matter how the ground shakes, this thing is going to be standing because the foundation was designed for it. Now imagine building a skyscraper like this out of cardboard. Well, the foundation's great. It was designed to stand an earthquake, you know, and anything you build on it should be fine, right? No. You have to build on a foundation what the foundation was designed for. For us, real world, real talk, that means living in truth and love and doing things that Jesus himself did and taught his disciples to do. When it comes to things like lifting each other up, saying, I'm higher than you because I have a better understanding. That's absolutely worthless garbage to be living a Christian life. That's the kind of thing that's wood and hay and straw. That needs to be thrown out. Instead, how did Jesus live? What did he do to his disciples? He elevated them above himself. He said, I'm here to serve you even though I'm God. When it comes to uh, taking sin lightly and encouraging one another to live holy lives, the Corinthians were convinced that, you know, <laughs> It's fine if it's sin. You know, we're so accepting, and Jesus was accepting, right? Because Jesus is forgiving anyone, we're not going to hold anyone to any standard. Sounds good. It has the name of Jesus on there. They got it from the foundation. They said, well, Jesus forgave all sins. We'll just forgive all sins and do nothing about it. If they had been careful in how they grew in their understanding of living holy lives, like Paul goes over in his letter to the Romans, should we continue sinning so that grace can keep on coming from Jesus? No, never! Absolutely not! You're dead to your sins. You died and were buried with Jesus in baptism, and when you came up, you were not the same sinful person. How can you even think of living that kind of life? These are the kinds of things that differentiate between are we building ourselves up and each other up with when we teach? With gold and silver and marble and heavy, sturdy stone that will survive a fire? Or are we just willy-nilly building up each other up with wood and hay and straw that will ultimately be burned? This is a convicting lesson. Happy New Year! <laughs> Moving on. After he mentions that you have to be careful with what you build with, he says why. He says, if I can find my place. Oh, I'm in Galatians. What is this? <laughs> when your dyslexia gets the best of you. There's no first Galatians. Here we go. He says, Each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer a loss, yet he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. I think Josh put it well last week when he said, sometimes I forget to think beyond salvation. You know, there's mentioned several times in scriptures a reward or a lack of a reward. And usually we think, oh, that's just salvation from sins and being within, in, with God in heaven, right? It seems here that there's more to it than just the foundational salvation. This whole section is saying, yes, you'll get salvation. That's the basis. That's base level. But then build on top of it. There was a lot of different uh, discussion as I was studying this on what the reward could be. I think that Josh had it best saying, 
Maybe I don't even know. Maybe I don't need to know. But the point is, we're told to be working for a reward. Jesus said constantly, store up treasures in heaven. Not there will be one treasure and everyone gets one. Yay, communism. He said, work towards spiritual things on earth so that your treasure in heaven will be great. Here we're told that if we are building well on the foundation of Jesus, you will receive a reward after the day of judgment, after it's tested by fire. I think the important thing to take away here is not to focus on what is or what isn't the reward. Um, we talked about Stephen's uh, sermon here in Randy's class and talked about how in Acts he told them over and over that they did not understand God, that they were too focused on uh, their, own, their own desires and their own power, that they completely missed the point. I think here too, if God has promised a reward, we know we're getting a reward and we should just do the work because God is God. So, a few things that I might want to mention about what the reward could be, or what part of it is, that we can actually understand here on earth. Building each other up is a good thing, yeah? <coughs> building each other up well is a good thing. And if building each other up is to be tested by fire on Judgment Day, if I build up Jonathan poorly, my brother, if I teach him things that are not completely true, if I try to use my own wisdom to make him a better person, I have built him up poorly, and it could lead to him being consumed in fire. That was one of the first uh, definitions of reward and loss that I read. You could be rewarded by bringing other souls to Christ or by losing them. And that's a scary thought. Now, whether or not that's the whole scope of this reward, doesn't matter. It's very true that my poor, shoddy workmanship could lead to someone else being burnt up by fire because they did not understand the truth of God. Um, another idea was the reward could simply be thanks from our Father, commendation from God himself, which sounds a little paltry because we're humans and a, a pat on the back and a thank you doesn't really mean as much from each other. But to have the Lord of the universe come up to you and say, you have done well, you have my thanks, you have my commendation, I bless you for what you have done for me. I can't imagine it, but trying to imagine it makes my brain hurt because that's amazing. To not only be in the presence of God, yeah, you're free from sin, you can be with me, but to also have praise from him himself would be an amazing thing. Again, I don't want to get bogged down by what is or what isn't the reward. The point is, by building up each other and ourselves in truth, in love, and not allowing us to be swayed by worldly doctrines, by worldly ideas, by popular uh, things that are happening in our culture, by staying true to the word and building each other up in it, in truth and in love, we will receive a reward. Our work will not be burned up. Now down here, after he says that your work will be tested by fire, verse 16, do you not know that you are a temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwells within you. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. We read from uh, 1 Kings chapter 8, when Solomon is praying to dedicate the physical temple he built for God. And if you read that prayer, and I highly encourage you to do in 1 Kings 8, he says a couple different times, Thank you, God, for allowing me to build this place for you. I know you don't need it. I know you already dwell everywhere. The world is your domain. Heaven is your throne. The earth is your footstool. You know, what could I possibly build you that would make you happy? But instead, he, he says over and over, may this temple represent where you dwell, that you are with us, because that's what you said. And he prays that when Israel has sinned and they're far away in captivity, that they'll pray toward the temple because that's where God said he would be. May they pray there because it's where God is. Not because the temple's nice, but because they want God. And when the strangers come from foreign lands because they've heard of your mighty works, may they pray toward this temple and be answered so that they know how great you are because you're God. The idea is the temple isn't anything more than a fancy building until God's presence is there then it becomes holy. Just like the burning bush was just a bush that was on fire, except God's presence was there. And then the ground all around it became holy. 
Where God is, holiness is. God is here. God is here in his temple. You are that temple. I find that amazing. And I also find it convicting because it means if I am God's temple, I have to make sure that I am holy and that I am teaching those who are listening to me how to be holy, how to be like God. It's a hard task, and it's why James says, let not many of you become teachers, because you will have a stricter judgment. But on the other hand, in some way we are all to teach each other, and to grow each other up, to build each other up. The last sentence is very convicting, both internally and for the world outside. It says, if any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and you are that temple. I think this has two applications. I think it has applications to the people who deny God outright, who say, you know, either God does not exist, or even if he does exist, I hate him, and I'm going to live my life in opposition to him. Someone who profanes the temple of God, in the end, God will destroy, because his temple is holy. To the early Christians here in Corinth, where persecution was happening, where people did not like the Christians, where you could be dragged off and killed just for following Christ, this would have been encouraging, one, to know that justice will be met. God will deal out justice. And two, that it's not on you to do it. Many other religions have had laws and rules of, you know, if someone profanes this religion, you kill them. Or if uh, somebody does an evil deed, you give them what's coming. Karma, an eye for an eye. The Christian religion says, God is handling the justice. It's up to you to simply follow and be a servant. The other, the other aspect of this, if you destroy the temple of God, God will destroy you, uh, kind of is a contrast to the two types of people who are building. Think of this. He says a couple verses earlier that even if you build shoddily, if you are on the foundation of Christ, even if your workmanship is terrible and you are not careful with how you build, you will still be saved. Kind of, a, kind of a weird lesson. Even if you were to build poorly, you would be saved, but everything would be burned up around you. Everything you'd worked for in your life would be gone, and you would be saved as though someone pulled out of a fire. Naked, burnt, hurt, but still alive. That's not the way I want to enter paradise. It's good to know that people who are foolish, People who did not fully understand, but who still clung to the foundation of Jesus, are not condemned. They will suffer, and it's not a good way to enter heaven, and you could cost someone else their salvation, but the point is Jesus has still saved. Jesus is still the foundation of our hope and faith. But this third option, someone who destroys the temple of God, not building carefully, not even building shoddily, someone who tears down the temple, the outside world's been judged, yes. If you are already in the church and you decide to tear down the temple, God will tear down you. Hoy, this is a convicting sermon. These few verses uh, have a lot to consider when it comes to our own walk and to the walk of those around us. It really makes you think of not just your own salvation, but of the church around you. I think that... Three different possibilities here are pretty clear-cut. You definitely don't want to be destroying the temple of God. You don't want to be doing anything that would tear someone down. You also don't want to be doing something that could be burned up at the last day. You don't want to cost anyone else their salvation. You don't want to make it so that when God sees you, he won't say, well done. He'll say, whew, you're lucky you got out. In the end, we must be very very careful to build each other up and to do it with the truth, with the word, and with love. So, as we continue growing in 2017, as we start the new year off, I think this is probably a really good sermon to start off with because it reminds us how we are to go forward. For Corinth, they had a lot of different distractions that caused shoddy spiritual workmanship. 